This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. So I get to introduce Steve Levitan tonight. So um, I have to say, the one thing you need to know about Steve Levitan is he's way too good looking to be a comedy writer. <laughs> it's not allowed in, in our industry to be that handsome if you're a comedy writer. And my apologies to all the other comedy writers here. I'm sorry, <laughs> I just realized. Um, so people, you've heard this, people say that Steve and his partner, Chris Lloyd, have resurrected once again half our comedy, and that's true, you know. Um, half our comedy goes kind of off the radar periodically, and then it takes some hero and a heroic effort like Steve's and Chris's to resurrect it, and they've, they've done that. And, and I, I, I can't tell you how happy those of us who love half our comedy are about that. You know, earlier today, one of the panelists that we had um, here called half our comedy, the cockroach of television programming. It just keeps coming back. You try to kill it, you can't kill it. It keeps coming back because of people like Steve and Chris. So, um, but I have to say that these guys have done more than just resurrect the form. They've brought it back with a, a depth and a warmth and a humanity and a quality that you really very seldom see. Like, it hardly ever happens that you know, the casting and the writing and the tone and the format and everything just comes together so beautifully as it, as it has, as these guys have made it uh, that way in, in, in Modern Family. Um, so you, you, you have programs, and so I'm not gonna go over, you know, who Steve is. Um, you know, he's, he's uh, how many Emmys, have, you know, I mean, it's ridiculous over his career. How, you know, the Emmys, the Producers Guild Awards, the Writers Guild Awards, the Humanitas Prize, the, you know, the, the uh, Peabody, I mean, every major award. He's, he's, and he's worked on shows, um, Wings, Frasier, Larry Sanders, he created Just Shoot Me. He's, you know, it's just lots of wonderful shows. But tonight, we're focusing on Modern Family. And, um, I have to say the most unusual thing about the show to me, and it's my favorite comedy on television, and I think it's one of my, it is my favorite comedy, well, except for mine, of any comedy that, <laughs> that's ever aired on television, because these guys have written each of those characters with such love. You know, there's such um, a kind of a reality and a humanity to every single character. You know, they write, you know, the older guy with a much younger wife, so beautifully. The overweight, overly smart kid, so beautifully. The gay couple, the functioning gay couple with the, with the, with the daughter, so beautifully. Um, I wanna read something that Steve said at, um, at a session with uh, ABC's showrunners for the press. This is, he's talking about the gay couple and the daughter. He says, one of the biggest surprises of our show is that America, or the world really, has embraced Mitchell and Cam. We're in 200 markets around the world, including, by the way, Vatican City. <laughs> and they've embraced Mitchell and Cam. I think that's interesting. It's easy for people to object to something in the abstract. But when you make it personal and show that these people have good hearts and are loving, committed parents, it's hard not to love them. So I say to the hard right, watch the show and see if you have it in your heart to love Cam and Mitch. The lies people tell about gay people and their relationship, gay people and their ability to raise children can only persist in the absence of contact with healthy gay couples or images of them. This 
is the respect and the love he brings to every single character in this show. And I, I, I'm so grateful and I applaud him for that. And I want to introduce him now so that he can introduce his pilot, Steve Levitan. Greatest introduction ever because she called me good looking and a hero. So I am on board. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I thank you guys for coming out. Uh, on a f is this Friday? On a Friday night when I was in college, I would have been at a bar. So I applaud the effort uh, for all of you. Um, uh, we're going to show the pilot for Modern Family, and then we're going to talk about it. So uh, I won't talk about it ahead of time, and we'll save everything for afterwards. And I hope you enjoy it. Is that cool? <laughs> <laughs> I actually haven't, I haven't seen that in a long time. I really haven't. I, 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 there were things I really didn't remember, and uh, it was, it was kind of fun to Did watch. you laugh? Uh, no, but <laughs> no, but the, the Lion King moment gets me every time. <laughs> like, I, I, it still does. So, I, I, I just, so uh, OK, so the obvious question is, how did you come up with the Lion King moment? <laughs> oh, boy, I don't even know. Uh, that's. Okay, uh, this is a terrible <laughs> start to this. Uh, uh, you know, we were just, yeah, yeah, you know, you're looking for things to build, and I don't know, somewhere along the line, you know, they were presenting this new baby to their family, and that image popped into our heads of, you know, from the Lion King, and we just, you know, we said we have to try to do that. And then, you know, fortunately, it was one of the things that just fell into place where we got so lucky time and time again with this show that we happen to be on ABC, which happens to be owned by Disney. And, um, <laughs> and uh, it's perfect. So, it, so Steve McPherson, who was the head of the network, really believed in that moment and personally called Elton John to ask him to wow. give us the rights or sell us <laughs> at great cost the rights to that, that song. And otherwise, uh, had it not been an ABC show, they never would have let us do it. Well, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so let's go back a little bit. So where does the idea for a show like that come from? I mean, you, you know, you've, you've been writing comedy for a long time, yeah. and you've been thinking about it, and then this. Well, uh, so Chris Lloyd and I had just come off of a, a we were on a deal together. We're, we're, we were old friends. We so wrote this is the guy on Taxi? It's not the Chris Lloyd, Christopher Lloyd, who's on Taxi and Back to the Future. It's a different Christopher Lloyd. Um, but he, uh, we, were, we, were, we worked on several shows together early in my career, Wings and Frasier. And um, we went our separate ways, did other things. I did Just Shoot Me. He stayed on Frasier for a long time. And, uh, and then we both found ourselves, after a, a series of failures, uh, you know, two broken <laughs> old guys uh, going, what do we do now? And we decided to to uh, you know, see if we can team up and try to change our luck a bit. So we did a series called Back to You with Kelsey Grammer and Patricia Heaton, and Ty Burrell was in that, Fred Willard, Josh Gad, um, some really amazing people. And uh, it was on the wrong network. It was, should have been a CBS show. Had it been a CBS show, it would probably still be on the air, and this probably never would have happened. So. Um, but that, that said, it, it lasted for part of a season or a season or whatever on Fox, and it wasn't picked up. And we were pissed off and bitter and older. And um, so we, we, but we had to, you know, our, we were on a deal where we had to come up with more shows. And uh, we would come in and talk about several ideas. Um, but we found that the most interesting thing we were ever talking about was what happened to us that weekend. <laughs> what happened, oh, I'm still ticked off about you know, something that happened with a teacher at school or this or that. And we realized that's, that's the show. That's, you know, no one's really doing a family show right now. And then we started asking, is there a, a way to, to reinvent the family show? To somehow make it seem new because uh, so it just didn't feel like those shows that had been done in the past. Like we didn't want to do a cutesy kid show uh, that, that felt too cutesy, you know, um, you know, Cosby was one of the, you know, great kid family shows, you know, Raymond, you know, had done it recently well, multicam. So we realized pretty quickly that the way to do this would be to, you know, try, try to do it single camera and, and talk about what's different about families since the days of Cosby since the days of, of Raymond, which hadn't been that long, but still, you know, what was new, 
you know, what felt new in families that hadn't been covered, new territory. So that, so we decided to tell, well, let's talk about multiple families and figure out a way to connect them, and, you know, and, uh, and that was a long process of figuring out what's the best way to connect it. We had for a while, you know, three siblings, three adult siblings, and what their relationship was, and for a while one of them was divorced so that we could tell dating stories, and, uh, you know, we had very, just different variations of that. We knew right from the beginning we wanted to tell, we wanted a, story, uh, a traditional, a somewhat traditional family in the middle, and that family was loosely based uh, on my family. My wife is, where are you, honey? Right there. She's hiding. And, uh, By the way, I just I want to tell you that I asked her that question about an hour ago, and she started to laugh. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but she, it's, it's, so it's loosely based on our on our family. With our with our, uh, we have two girls and a boy, and uh, uh, in a lot of ways, especially in the beginning, I was a lot like Phil Dunphy because I thought I was very cool, <laughs> and I didn't understand why my kids were ashamed of me. And, uh, and, and all that. And then, um, but <laughs> uh, uh, over the years, and that's a whole other story, I've, I, it's become very clear that I'm, I'm actually Claire, and my <laughs> wife is Phil, um, because she lives in the moment, and she's very carefree, and she's the one playing with the kids and all that, and I'm the one worrying about everything like Claire. So, but anyway, that's a, I digress. But we knew we wanted a traditional family. We quickly realized, I mean, right from the beginning, that we wanted uh, a gay couple uh, raising a child because we, we know several, several of our friends were going through that and that hadn't been covered. What had been covered very well, you know, Will and Grace and other shows had been sort of the, you know, fabulous, stylish, fit gay guys um, who were hilarious and, and wonderful and it, and it broke ice and um, you know, broke barriers and, and, it, and, and a very important show, I think, in, the, in sociological history. Um, uh, when, the, when that story is told, I think it's very important. But we wanted to take it to the next step and do something different. So we, you know, because the, the gay friends we have were not so fabulous, <laughs> did not dress so well, were not in the best shape. Uh, and, and they were loving, committed, for, you know, people. Our casting director, Jeff Greenberg, who did such an amazing job on this, has been with his partner for 25 years. That is longer than 98% of my straight friends. That is a committed, loving, long-term relationship, and that needs to be shown, and we felt. We did think from the very beginning that it will, in some way, uh, limit our... I don't know, success our, our audience, because some people will just say, nope, I don't want it. Um, and, but, uh, you know, fortunately, and I think it's a testament to Eric and Jesse, uh, um, the world, as Marcy uh, read that quote, you know, I think has accepted them. And I think it's really because of the charm of those guys and how funny they are. Um, and then we... Well, can I just say this? It's also because of the writing. I mean... Uh, by the way, I... <laughs> Uh, yes, the, way, the way you set them up in that very first scene oh, on the plane well, with the cream puffs thing, I mean, is... Thank you. I mean, how can you not like... They happen to be wonderful actors and they happen to be doing a great job, but how, given that moment, how can you not yeah. care for them? And, and I want to say from the beginning and, I mean, from the offset, uh, 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 the onset, uh, we have 12 writers on our show uh, who are brilliant, uh, you know, and they're all involved and everybody on the staff brings their family experiences and their lives and their talent and they're all amazing and the the show wouldn't be what it is without them so that goes for as a blanket statement for everything i'm saying tonight um and uh yeah but you know it's what's what was interesting there you know something that was important um the first joke the first interview for them which was really important to us was the one about um uh, they thought about asking some of their, a couple of their lesbian friends to help in the process, but oh my God, they'd be too angry. They're angry enough, or whatever that, the line was. They're mean enough. They're mean <laughs> enough as it is, yeah. Um, and that was a really important joke to us because what we wanted to show right off the bat was that, okay, yes, they're a subculture in some way, but they have their own prejudices. 
and we all do. And so we're not, we're not elevating them and saying, look at them and aren't they you know, better than or this or you should, that everybody has their own stuff. So that was an important, it wasn't just a joke to us, it was a, it was a signal to that, oh, they're not gonna be the, the voice of the gay community, they're gonna be these guys who have their own shit to deal with. Um, so, so that, anyway, that happened. And then we, we the, the, the third couple, so we were pretty good, we knew we wanted that. The third couple was trickier, and we went through a lot of variations on that. We, uh, for a long time, uh, well, f- like I said, there were, you know, it was a sibling for a while, wasn't the father. That was an insight um, that uh, came, you know, late, sort of after a lot, after a lot of variations. They, they were three families who lived on a cul-de-sac together um, that weren't related, but they were all tight because we figured, oh, they can you know, intertwine and, you know, the easy access and all that. Um, but we, we had the insight uh, about that, wait, they could be, it could, one of them could be an actual parent and we can get into some other stuff because it's, you know, Chris had worked on Frasier, I had done Just Shoot Me, those dealt very much with father, adult, a father and adult child relationships and that's ver- uh, such a rich area so why don't, rather than just having three siblings, let's, let's try to involve one of the parents. So now let's add, uh, you know, a different culture to it. So uh, for a little while, we talked about th- his wife being uh, African-American, you know, and uh, we were open to that for a long time, and it kind of came down to a, a casting thing and um, w- uh, which voice we felt we could write better. And um, for a, a long time, and I was a big proponent of it, Manny had Asperger's um, because uh, a friend of a good friend of mine, his son has Asperger's, and the son cracks me up to, yeah. to no end. I mean, I think he's the funniest kid in the world, <laughs> and uh, a ch- an utter challenge, and a and a delight, and a challenge, and it's complex, and we wanted to throw challenges at Jay. Um, so, you know, we played around with that for a long time, you know, for, uh, I mean, a couple of weeks of just trying to write it and feel it. We brought my friend in and we talked, blah, 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 blah. And ultimately, um, I really think Chris couldn't wrap his head around it. He just didn't feel like he could write it well. In the meantime, Chris's son, you know, among other things, for Christmas had asked for a burgundy smoking jacket. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so, you know, it, you know, one day it just occurred to us, well, How what old is he? You know, he was, a, you know, he was a, like eight years old or something at the time. And, and so one day we had the insight, you know, once we landed on, you know, it, Gloria being Latina, um, what if, uh, you know, what if this kid is like, uh, what we use for uh, the description was a, uh, he was a 11 year old uh, Antonio Banderas. You know, he just was, he was a lover, and he, everything was, uh, you know, he saw the romance and everything, and he thought like, an, you know, he th- was an old soul uh, from the day he was born. And that felt, you know, a real, very real to us because, you know, the father had bailed early. It was him and his mom. You know, he assumed that role, and, um, and it just start, started to feel right, and suddenly you could see how that kid could be because we wanted to throw the challenge at Jay. He's got a new kid. He already had a gay son. And, you know, by the way, as, as you saw structurally here, it's hard to go back in time if you've seen the show. Until the moment everybody walks into Cam and Mitchell's house for, for that last scene, you don't know these families are related. You're sitting there, you know, trying to, you know, you're just thinking you're watching three stories. And that's a, another interesting uh, thing. Well, I'll, tr- I'll return to that in one second, but, um, but we, uh, wait, I was saying something. Jay, back. Jay, the Jay, Jay, Jay. Okay, challenges. so Jay had already raised a gay son, right? which was clearly for a guy like Jay was an issue. He wasn't, he didn't deal with it well. We showed that. He, you know, he had trouble. So now we didn't want to give him a, an easy son <laughs> this time around. We want to give him a different challenge because to us, Jay, he had, re- he had gotten divorced. He wanted the trophy wife. 
He meets Gloria, who wouldn't want that. He thinks fantastic. Uh, I got the hot young thing. Okay, you know, it's not ideal that she comes with this package, this son, but I'll deal with it. I mean, in the beginning, it was very important to us that he drove a two-seater because he, now he can't even drive his own car because he, uh, he's got this kid. And, um, and he, he, this kid became a different version of a son that was a challenge to him. The son was very heterosexual, is obsessed with, with women, but it throws Jay, you know, in a completely different way. Um, so that was, that was the dynamic of, uh, you know, of, trying to, of, of how we, we landed on those. Uh, and Jay thought he had married, you know, he wanted the, the pushover. He wanted the, the obedient trophy wife. And he got... Which he, he is he, not. Because he had, as we reveal later on, his first wife was Shelley Long, and she was a handful. And, you know, you can see why that was troublesome. But so, we, you know, he marries this woman, and she turns out to be twice as strong as he is. And he is basically bullied, and, you know, he's at, you know he, he has to do whatever she says. And so his life is, is thrown. So we tried to lay in as many dynamics as we Did could. Did you think about the multi-generational a- aspect as well? Because yeah. putting him in the position of being a father and then having, let's see, one, two, three, four, five kids, five kids in the, r- in, in the various rooms from each of the three families, if you add them all up, that's a lot of younger generation. Yeah. Um, it was good because we covered, you know, we covered a lot of, you know, we covered a wide age range. And I thought there were, you know, what was nice was, as it turns out, there were a lot of points of entry for the audience. Some, you could find somebody to relate to. And if you didn't like one of the, it's one of the beauties of this form. Um, you know, not only is it documentary, but there are multiple storylines. Because if you don't like one of the stories, it's over before you know it. 30 seconds later, you're on to the next story, and you're back to the one that you like. Or you're, back, you're away from the one you didn't like. And so it all added up. It gave people a lot of ways in. See, I think um, one of the things I think is so fascinating about this, and especially about the, the pilot, is the challenge of having, well, 11 characters to start with. I mean, you know, there are, what, um, six friends, and there are four Seinfelds, yeah. and there are, what, five Raymonds? And this is 11, and yet before the title sequence, you've really set in stone the personalities of all three families. And I think the cream puffs thing does it, the scene um, where they're talking about her village, and she says, what's the word? And he goes, murders. Yeah. And, and, the, and the third one is obviously in the, in, in the first one with, with Phil and Claire, where she says, wait, wait, um, just a second, she says something like, um, I've got it here, I've done my job. If, you know, if she doesn't end up naked on the be- half naked on the beach, I've done my job, he goes, our job. She says, I've done our job. And you know what their relationship is. You're done. You get it. And you're, you've, you've already, the two of you or the group of writers has already taken them out of the character, caricature stereotype realm. Yeah, I mean, uh, we spent a long time, you know, we spent a couple months on that, really working through the characters. Uh, I remember one little, you know, thing we did, which, which was because we were just trying to get the voices, or, you know, we just, I find it helpful just to try to start writing dialogue. And it was un, it was not related to a scene. We didn't really have a structure of a story yet, but just to, you know, who are these people? And um, I remember, you know, the line, um, I'm the cool dad, that's my thing. That's my thing. Thing. Um, for Phil, and, and how that, you know, I instantly, I kind of felt like I knew who that character was. You know, that's one of the mistakes that you see um, a lot in TV and in movies and whatever, but, and by the way, that we are still very capable of making those same mistakes, believe me, but uh, of not being clear with your character. You know, make a choice in the beginning, make a strong choice. It may not end up being the right choice or the choice you stay with, but the stronger the choice, the easier it is to write, because you know, the jokes, the best jokes come from character, not from rhythmy wordplay and, you know, all that. The jokes are, are funny because you start to understand who these people are. And, and so that's what we just tried to be very clear with who, you know, with who they are. Alex and Haley, you know, what's the difference between Alex and Haley? Why do we need two girls? Because if they're the same girls, then let's just have one girl. Otherwise, we're just, 
You know, we're never going to be able to write for both of them. So, you know, one was superficial from line one, from the first word out of her mouth, first line out of her mouth was, you know, why are you yelling? Why don't you just text me? Right. I got, I think you get a little bit of sense of who that character is. And, um, you know, uh, uh, Alex just, you know, the opposite of that. Serious. Uh, you know, the worrier. And again, like the, the line, um, for us, another important line in the pilot was when Alex came in and said, the little <laughs> just shot me. <laughs> um, and ABC had a big problem with that. And, um, you know, it was one of the things that we fought really hard for because, you know, we said, look, at, we've got a pilot filled with cute kids. We need to send a message that this is not just going to be that show that you're expecting, the cutesy show. And I said, and it was true, it is exactly a line that my daughter said. <laughs> and I, what I Wait, found I, to be... I have to ask the question. So somebody, your son shot your daughter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, okay. the shooting thing, <laughs> the shooting thing is, is so um, crazy authentic that the hats, the way he wore the hats, the underwear, the jacket, it's all 100% real. It all happened. <laughs> and... Wait, wait. So you shot your son? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so d I, I'm sorry. Did you do the show? Just shoot me. I just yeah, I did. Okay. I have, yeah, and I'm also uh, yeah, I'm, I have yeah, very uh, you know gun control guy and everything. And yet, see, my son, my son, um, he wanted a uh, airsoft gun. These little plastic bullets, and he went through that period. <laughs> I wish he would be over that period where he was kind of obsessed with you know, those things. And so we finally said, okay, listen, you know, I got it. I, I, when I was a kid, I wanted those too. You know, okay, we'll set up some targets in the back. And, but listen, if you ever shoot anything living, any bird, any squirrel, Sister. any person, anybody, I'm going to shoot you. That's the deal. <laughs> because all he was trying to do is make sure he didn't hurt anybody. I didn't want him to kill any birds or... You know, I, I just, I, I didn't need so that. So you thought that was going to be deterrent? I thought that was thought really that was good parenting. Deterrent enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and sure enough, you know, we hear a scream from the backyard. It happened to be from with his cousin who just got shot. And, uh, you know, we, <laughs> we quickly, uh, you know, said, okay, we're doing this. And he just said, okay, one second, I just have to go to the bathroom. And he came down with like six pairs of underwear <laughs> and two hats and a jacket and all that. And I actually have it on videotape somewhere, but um, <laughs> it's a really good family moment. I'm proud of. <laughs> but um, so and, and an, an interesting story. You didn't shoot your daughter's boyfriend as well. No, that, that okay. part we made up. Um, but uh, we were pitching the show around as a little interesting side note. And um, we made a, a, a keynote presentation, which is some, something that nobody, I'm told, had ever done before. Um, because we had so many characters. We had, you know, we were selling 11 characters. So we were trying to, so imagine going into, a, you know, your, cup, your network executives and we walk in and we say, okay, these are the characters and we name 11 people. <laughs> it, you can't keep it in your head. So I made a, um, a, a, a keynote presentation with all the characters and it laid them out by family and it was really sort of like un the story unfolded and you saw pictures and we used pictures of, of actors that we thought were the right type. Um, some of whom we ended up getting. Um, uh, one of whom was Sarah Gilbert as Alex. We grabbed a picture of just because that was the right type for us. And, um, and um, so we, we, we showed this and it was very effective. But during the pitch to ABC, they said, well, what kind of stories are we, you, know, you going to tell? And I said, well, he, you know, here's a funny story that just happened to me. And I started telling the shooting story. And I realized, wait a minute, I have my computer and I had the video, and I just go, hold on a second. And I hadn't planned to do it, and I bring up the video, I play the scene, which looks remarkably like that scene, <laughs> and um, they bought it on the spot. They said, that's it, we get it. Wow. So uh, it was, you know, like one of those, another lucky moment in the show. Well, when we were actually thinking of doing the session, we were sitting with Marcy and Gary Newman and Rick Rosen, we were sort of talking about it and came to the idea of, of showing the pilot for Modern Family. And we were t I was talking about it uh, with Gary and he said that, and I said, so how rough was the pilot? And he said, and I just remember the word, you're here someplace, Gary, right? He is, yes, there he is. He said, it came out fully baked. 
fully baked. And I, I looked at, I think I looked at Marcy and I said, really, do you think so? And she said, absolutely. Um, that has to be really, really, fully back, baked meaning the, it, when, it, when you looked at it, it worked. Um, how do you feel about that? I mean, that seems like rather unusual. We just heard in a, in a session earlier about recasting season where people, you know, look at their actors and they yeah. switch them out and yeah. they switch out the scenes and... Well, we got incredibly lucky with the actors. I mean, that said, it's funny because I really hadn't seen the pilot in, it has to be well over a year, at least. Um, and there are scenes in there that, I, that look rough to me now uh, that don't, aren't as funny, I think, as, like, we, we wouldn't have let that scene through today. Um, but, uh, you know, you're doing more in a pilot. You're, you're, you're learning everything on the fly. Um, but we just got so ridiculously lucky with our casting that, and it could have been, and I can't tell you how uh, close we were to screwing it up uh, <laughs> a number of times. Actively tried to screw it up, get somebody different. Um, you know, the network did not want Ty Burrell, and they said, well, just wow. let it go, it's not going to happen. And so what we did with Ty um, is we brought Ty to my backyard and we shot a screen test of that shooting scene with him and we shot a scene in my kitchen with him and uh, uh, Sarah Highland uh, to show what that dynamic would be. And in fact, there, and Ty also in my living room where Ty danced the high school musical dance <laughs> to, to my kids who had to act and pretend like that was you know, me doing that. And, um, and we showed it to the network, and they finally saw Ty. They finally got him. And, you know, I shudder to think what our show would be like without him. He, he, there was never any doubt in your mind about him. No, we, so you've we, we knew, we knew how, for him all the way. We knew how brilliant he was. We had written it so specifically for him. Uh, and we brought other actors in. We tried, and we even made a couple offers to other actors because the network said, let it go. And it, when those didn't happen, uh, thank God, uh, you know, we just said, that's it. We got to, you know, we got to push this through. So, um, Julie Bowen, um, we were just talking about Fully Baked. And um, my sense, yeah. having seen the pilot, is either she has in her contract some requirement that she carry towels in yeah. front of her or laundry or a cake or a pocketbook. Yeah, or, so Julie... Uh, and she's that, in, got something in the oven, too. And what you just too. saw, Julie was uh, eight months pregnant with twins. And um, <laughs> huge. I mean, uh, you know, she's a very slender person, but, you know, twins. And, um, and so we just did every trick in the book. I mean, there was a lot of concern that we were going to have to reshoot. We were going to have to reshoot it, and people didn't want to cast her because how are we going to do this? But, you know, we just didn't find anybody else that we liked nearly as well. And so we, um, we just did everything. She folded laundry. She had a laundry basket in front of her. She had cereal boxes in front of her. She had kids in front of her. She wore this loose sweater that whenever she bent down, the sweater would go like this. We did, you know, everything we could think of to hide it. And, you know, uh, I thought about saying it before the pilot uh, showing it, but, it, you know, you, you just, you don't know. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's one of those... I mean, I don't think I caught it for the first two times I saw it, and then the third time it just... Everything was very strange about the way she was being People shot. give us an enormous amount of credit because, wow, what an interesting insight to her character that she has to work, she never stops doing things. And she's always <laughs> folding and you're so brilliant. And we're like, no, 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 we're just hiding. <laughs> we're uh, in a long tradition, American tradition, hiding the pregnancy, so yeah. So, you, I mean, you talked before about uh, wanting to do this as a one camera shoot. Uh, the documentary pieces of it, the part of the, where, where the characters are talking to camera, I mean, how did that sort of come into it? That, that certainly didn't exist in earlier um, situation comedies or scripted well, it comedies. Well, you know, it did. And it then did. it did, of well, course, it, it, in, in the office. In the office. Yeah. Um, and did you pick up on that, or was it something that you thought would work in a different way for you? How did you... Well, okay, so I had um, uh, done a uh, very strange experimental documentary the studio, Gary Newman in the studio, was kind enough to indulge me um, in this show I did called Foot Hooker, um, <laughs> which was um, uh, about a rock band, uh, uh, this uh, rock band, American rock band that's huge in, in Asia, 
um, you know, uh, like, you know, they're huge in Japan and whatever, but they can't get arrested in the U.S., so they decided to do a reality show here to try to get noticed. And, um, and so that was done mockumentary style, and I loved it. I did a, the whole, we shot the whole thing, edited, cast, half-hour pilot for 28000 dollars. Um, and uh, uh, it almost got, it got picked up on Fox, and then it got unpicked up. But anyway, I loved, I fell in love with that form because the jokes were so, the ability to pop in and learn what a character is saying, or f thinking, or to take a scene that isn't quite working and put a joke right in the middle of it, or to not have to do that horrible pipe, the exposition of, uh, you know, you know how you said last week that you were afraid of spiders. <laughs> well, you know, there's a spider up in the attic or, you know, whatever. That horrible dialogue that comes when you have to quickly convey some information. We can just get to the heart of it. So very, very early on, so I, I was a big proponent of that. I loved the form. I loved the messy camera work um, because it, it allowed you to, to not worry. I think all the, to me, you know, these, a lot of comedies got into, for, for a while, it became that, you know, uh, I, you know, the shot, the character walks in the room, the, the camera goes close up on their shoe, goes up their leg, <laughs> and as, a, as, the cam as, a, as the character begins to scream, the camera goes down their throat and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, to, it's, it, you know, it's jerking off to me. It's, it's like, it's a waste, it's an utter, it's not it's funny. It's stuff. It's stuff. It's not, doesn't, it never makes me laugh. It, right. It's just, you know, it's a director going, look what I can do. And, and, I, and I, to me, what's funny? Just get to the, the, it's that loose, it's that awkward stuff between people. And, and if, if the best take that we have of what that actor did has a camera bump in it or it goes slightly out of focus, in that show, you can't use the best take. Right. And our show makes it look more real. So we basically, and we set it in LA. To me, an important element. Because we basically said, let's eliminate every barrier to comedy, to just what makes this thing funny and easy to make and just doesn't get in our way. So why, why should we set it in, you know, Chicago or New York or Indiana because we think that that's what the heartland wants to see when we have to shoot it in L.A. and then we have to hide, we have to go into hiding palm trees and <laughs> license plates and blah, blah, blah. No, let's just shoot it here. Let, you know what? I think, you know, as has been proven, you know, there was a concern by some, you know, America hates people from California. They hate Californians. They hate Los Angeles people. They, America hates them. They, they don't seem to mind them too much. You know, it's, <laughs> it's fine. They're, you know, because people are, they're, they're all living the same lives. So in the office, at least, you know, the, it started. Oh, oh, by the way, in the office. So yeah. I mean, let me say, we were huge fans of the office. And I, and, and I tipped my hat in a big way to the office because they opened the door. You know, they made, it, they made it so we didn't have to explain anything. I, I, I mean, I noticed that because there is a documentary going on in the office. I mean, that, they sort of have, have given a foundation for the reason yeah. they're doing it. You don't do that. You know, in the beginning, we, we were very strict about it. We said, okay, we're a documentary. And the, the original concept for the show was it's a family, sh a show about three families, one traditional, two non-traditional, <laughs> as told through the eyes of a Dutch documentary filmmaker. <laughs> and the, the, and we, that was a character that we had for a while in the pitch, the original pitch. He, his name was Gert Flirty. <laughs> and um, he had been, uh, 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 he was around Claire's age. As a kid, he had been a foreign exchange student who lived with, with Mitchell and Claire and Jay and Dee Dee for a, a year or a semester or whatever it was. Gert had a mad crush on Claire. Mitchell had a mad crush on Gert. <laughs> and he came back to, to tell the story of this family that he had lived with for a while as a kid. And, um, and the show was originally entitled uh, My American Family. Um, Two things happened. Uh, we wrote it. You know, we had a couple funny things for Gert, but we very quickly realized we don't need him. Dutch and people aren't funny. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Gert just was not funny, um, and uh, we just didn't need it. It just, it just, it fell right away. It just, 
you pulled it right out and you didn't miss it for, for one second. And um, uh, so, um, I don't know, we just, we, we oh, and then we, we said, after a while we said, you know what, uh, I quickly came to this. I don't want the, the, the fact that we're trying to say we're a, a documentary get in the way of the comedy, again. So if th something is funnier shot in a way that maybe it wouldn't be shot in a documentary, but it's funnier, let's do it that way. I mean, it, to me, it's, I, you know, to, to just sort of interject this, it's, um, it's interesting that this convention that didn't exist at all, then kind of showed up in the office in England, then came over in the UK, then came over here in the office, and now you guys just sort of did it and took away all of the infrastructure that made it sort of logical and rational and just put it in there, and all of a sudden, we who are watching this pilot and the show, all of a sudden almost feel as if the characters are talking to us. Yeah, because, you know, again, uh, the comedy watching audience had, had at least seen The Office, so they kind of got that. There had been a million reality shows at this point that are shot exactly like this. And it just, it turned out it was a non-issue. No, no one questioned it ever. And so now what I always say is we're not a documentary. There are not documentarians living with these families. And I always say the reason is because if these families actually allowed documentarians to follow them around and their children around, I would hate them. <laughs> uh, so let's, in fact, let's instead, you know, j let's, just, let's just say it's a family show shot documentary style. And again, just eliminating the things that get in the way. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's kind of simple. And no one ever, no one, that's something we don't get criticized for. So one last question before we throw it out to the audience. Um, so you do the pilot. How much of the first season, how much of that do you know? How much of the arc of this show over the first season do you know when you shoot the pilot? Z uh, z pretty much zero. None? Yeah. Have you, do you have idea? Do you sort of have a, a, a drawer, drawer full of ideas that you may or may no, not but we, use? You know, what we said was, and it's funny because I just, did a, I just uh, oversaw a pilot that's in contention now in this whole game that goes on every, uh, uh, every spring. <laughs> and they, the networks ask for stories. Well, give us a, some of the stories you would tell, which I think is the biggest waste of time in history because you don't know. And you, c you can write down a list of stories. You're never going to do those stories. And I don't know why they don't realize this and why they put it through. But we, Chris and I just, we wrote one paragraph. They, and the, the whole thing was, give us five stories that you would tell. And, and what we said was, um, Basically, we said, Chris and between the two of us, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see if I'm remembering the number. It was something about between the two of us, we've done like a thousand <laughs> episodes of television. We will tell stories about the things going on in our lives, such as texting, video conferencing, uh, parent teacher conferences, this, that, do da 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 da. One sentence, uh, I think you'll be happy. <laughs> so, I mean, basically that. And, you know, it, it, it just, it, that's, and that's what we did. I mean, you know, at a certain point, get into business with people and trust them to do their work. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'd like to open it up for, to, for other people to um, talk to Steve and uh, ask questions. Uh, can we have some questions from the audience? Anybody have any questions beyond what we've talked about? I mean, there were, there were times when, you know, uh, like when they didn't want to cast Phil, where, you know, that was, uh, things were getting a little, heavy then, but um, I think that's an old paradigm of, uh, you know, the, the network and the studio hack and, you know, we're the writers and we know it all. I think that's just tired and old and I'm bored with it. And I don't think it's the case. I, I, look, at, our job is to, to write this and to come up with these ideas and to protect these ideas. And from the beginning of my career, before, well before I had the power or clout or whatever, or the, hist you know, the, the, the track record to, to defend it, you know, a friend of mine told me a great story. He said, very early on, before I, when I was a staff writer on Wings, he, said, he told me a story, he'd done a pilot, it was built on this dynamic between these two, you know, this man and a woman, and it was contentious, and they said, you know what, I don't, we don't the network said, we don't like her. You know, she comes across as bitchy. So, you know, soften her and da-da-da-da. 
And he's like, no, but that's where all the comedy is. And they said, listen, if you want to get it on the air, you're going to have to soften her. So he did. He softened her. It was terrible. <laughs> it didn't get picked up. And they said, you know what? It's just, it's just, it was just too soft. There was nothing there. And he said, but you told me to do that. And, he, and they said to him, well, you shouldn't have listened. <laughs> and you know what? It's like the greatest story that was ever told to me ever. And it was so early in my career that I just filed it away and I said, okay, you know what? If I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail on my own terms. Now, that doesn't mean you, you have to be a jerk about it. Um, and that's where I think some writers, showrunners, whatever, make that mistake, where they think they're the, the other people are the enemy. And they treat them like the enemy, and so they become the en enemy. But I think you can say, it's very fair to say, a network executive, by the way, a writer, a, a, a writer on our staff could give a dumb note. It happens every day, and we don't jump down their throats. Everybody has good ideas and bad ideas. And if a network, and I don't care if it's the president of the network, you know, I always say, if it's a pre I don't care if it's, if it's the president of the network or if it's the security guard. If it's a good note, I'm going to listen to it, and I'm going to take it. And if it's a bad note, I'm, I'm going to ignore it. I think it's fine to say, you know what? I appreciate it. I think what you're trying to say to me is, at that moment, something Dis you disconnected emotionally from the story at that point. Because you're telling me you, you think it'd be better if she weren't so, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that's the problem. I think it's a symptom of the problem, perhaps. And so let me see if I can figure out a way to address that to make you like her more in that moment or make that clearer in that moment. Or sometimes I'll say, you know what? I appreciate that. Thank you. But that's not the story we're telling. And Sometimes that has been met with, uh, you know, that's been a problem. I try to do it nicely, and, you know, I try to keep in mind that these are people, you know, I always, I always say to the writers and everybody, these are people with families. They go home to their kids. They're nice people. They're trying to do their best. They've got a lot of, it's not an easy job. It's a hard job. So just keep that in mind, and don't, don't do, never take a note, ever, that you don't agree with. At the end of the day, my job is to protect the show. And if I, for some reason, cave to a note that I don't believe in, I'm not doing my job. So I would, uh, so there's a way to do it nicely, but uh, stick to your guns. I mean, my two favorite moments of the series so far for me uh, are that Lion King moment. <laughs> and I really do, I still kind of get like this weird sort of tingly feeling every time I see it. I know it sounds <laughs> terrible, but. Um, uh, and, and I, um, the, the episode we did, Caught in the Act, um, when the kids walk in on Claire and Phil having sex, um, that, um, that is a moment that, uh, that's a moment, uh, that I'm particularly, uh, both proud and ashamed of, um, uh, uh, proud because I think it really played really well and realistically on this on the screen, and it, it conveyed everything I wanted it to. And, you know, a shame because it comes from real life. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that was that. There you go. So F-bomb moment, big, little, hmm? Yeah, I mean, the F-bomb. Yeah, the F-bomb. Does um, everybody know what the F-bomb moment is? And no. Lily starts uh, saying <laughs> all the time. And, um, uh, and, and it, you know, we got a lot of heat for that until everyone saw the episode. I mean, there was a lot of heat, because I, I, I had to do a, a, a panel for press tour the week before. They said, what's coming up? You know, what's exciting coming up? They always want to know what you're doing, and we never want to tell them, because it always just sounds terrible. And I just said, well, we're pretty excited, because next week, Lily says <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and it happened to be, and I had no idea, it happened to be the day that the head of ABC was testifying before Congress <laughs> um, about standards and you know, issues, whatever. And so it was this horrible <laughs> collision of, of things. And um, so there was a, for one week, there was this giant uproar over it about how dare we have her say this and how dare we put the words in her mouth and it's terrible and this is a, you know, symptomatic of this show that's supposed to be so above this and it's, uh, and then everyone saw it and everyone went, yeah, that's realistic, that happens. I mean, because it does not, it happens to everybody. You know, eventually at one point your kid will pick up on a word 
They'll say that word. You will laugh inappropriately. <laughs> they will take the cue, think it's, think it's funny, and then keep saying it. And so that was really the story. But with, I, mean, I, I mean, without exception, the minute it aired, all controversy from the most conservative groups went right away. So I think I, I have to read you a tweet that you, you tweeted about that at one point, and I, I oh. found it somehow. And your tweet was, for the record, when shooting the actress who played, uh, well, I'm sorry, for the record, when shooting, the actress who plays Lily never actually dropped the F-bomb. After, who knows, she gets cranky when tired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had her say fudge. Fudge. She never, we never actually asked a two and a half year old to walk <laughs> around saying, but we, you know, we bleeped it and she said fudge. So that will probably scar her for life when she thinks fudge is a really serious word. Now. She may never eat fudge again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that, that Gloria is, um, what's, what's, what I think is, is, is great about Gloria and why I think Sofia Vergara, by the way, who's amazing and, in, 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 you know, 80% of the success of Gloria is just from her. Um, but we're, we're, we often go wrong in this business is we take a woman who looks like Sofia Vergara and we turn her into a sexy character. And I think where we went right in this case was we took a character like Sofia Vergara and we turned her into a fiercely protective mother who loves her husband not for his money, but because she thinks he's a good man who is the opposite of the shit that she was married to first. And uh, she will, I think that women in Gloria see a woman who will throw herself in front of a bus for her son. And, uh, you know, she's not, she's, stro she's smart, she's strong, uh, you know, she's opinionated. Uh, that may be somewhat stereotypical, but it's authentic and it certainly exists. Um, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, what we often hear from a lot of Latinas uh, is thank you so much for putting on a strong character, Latina character on TV who is not a maid. So um, uh, I'll take issue with that, but I appreciate the comment. What advice would you give to a student like me who has no experience in film whatsoever, but has a strong desire in working in television and comedy, what would your advice be to us who want to get involved? Well, um, first of all, obviously, it, it, a lot of it depends on exactly what you want to do. Uh, I mean, th yeah, this is going to be filled with cliches, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, first of all, don't let anybody stop you. you got, but you got to you gotta do it. Here's what I hear all the time. I wanna be a writer. I wanna be a comedy writer. Oh, great. Um, what, if, what, are you, what have you written? Well, I'm thinking about some things, <laughs> and I got, I got this thing I'm thinking about, this story I'm working. No. When I was, um, uh, when I decided I wanted, that I was gonna take the plunge in this, and I really, it took, it was a long process, I just started writing. You know, I was working in another career, um, and I just, at my desk, you know, I would, I just started writing shows, you know, you know episodes of other shows. And, and I was living in the Midwest. I had no connections to the entertainment industry whatsoever. Uh, I didn't know what <laughs> I was going to ever do with these fake shows that I was writing. And I'm sure I looked insane. I kind of think I was, you know, I was, I, well, I remember one night, all my, I was living with two roommates and they're, you know, it was Friday night, they're going out to the bars and, you know, it was all going to be fun. And I was working on, like, this Cheers spec script. And they're like, you know, come on, we're going to go. We're going to go out. And I'm like, I'm, I think I'm going to stay here and, and try to work on this. And they're like, you're going you're gonna to not go to a real bar <laughs> <laughs> to stay here and work on your fake show? And, you know, it occurred to me at that moment that I was kind of like that crazy guy who builds a rocket in his backyard. And everyone was like, what the fuck are you doing? And, but I, it, no one was gonna stop me. I just got it in my head and I just started writing. And I, you know, before I knew it, I had four sample scripts that I could start to send out. And then I, every opportunity I, I had, I tried to get people to read them. And, and, you know, someone told me, look at, I like the script, it's good, but you're never gonna get a job living in Chicago. You need to live out in LA, 
So my whole family was in L.A., my friends were in L.A., my whole life was in L.A., my career, I, got, I, I moved to L.A. I mean, they were all in, excuse me, they were all in Chicago, 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 <laughs> go back. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, and I left and I, and, I, and I went because that's what you need to do if you want to be in this, at least in, you know, my end of the business. You know, there are a lot of other, there are a million other jobs, you know, on, on the production crew, um, you know, uh, at the studios, at the networks, um, you know, all sorts of things. But, the, you know, the best thing you can do is get experience, try to get internships, try to get, meet people, talk to people, come to these kinds of things. But um, there, if you want to be a writer, the, it, it's, a, it's one of the most amazing things about this thing. You can sit right, you can go home right now and do, you have everything you need to do that job. So you just have to do it. And, if, and I promise you this, as tough as, ever, er, as, tough as it is, and I, there are uh, currently, you know, probably 100,000 people trying to be writers or whatever in LA or whatever. I promise you, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, if you write a brilliant script, you will get a job. I, I home, we look for brilliant scripts all the time, and I read very experienced writers all the time, and we are rarely impressed. So if you write a great script, it will get you a job. It's just that simple. So on that note, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. This has been, um, I hope, for the audiences we've had all day, an extraordinary day, illuminating a lot of the time pretty damn funny. Um, and I wanted to thank everybody who was involved in today. Um, Marcy Carsey, Dick Wolf, who are the Carson Wolf, Carsey Wolfs. Um, Gary Newman, Rick Rosen, Steve Lafferty, who helped so much with the, with the uh, shaping of this event. The, uh, the committee from uh, Film and Media Studies, the group of professors who helped us so much on helping to shape this event. Constance Penley and Ron Rice, my co-directors on Carsey Wolf Center. Can I, can I say, can I, yeah. Gary Newman, where's Gary? He's over there. President of our studio. It's been a big, important part of Modern Family from the beginning. Absolutely. A major supporter. And last but not least, and I've said it before, and if you have a program, look in the back because their names are there. It's, it's uh, the staffs of the Film and Media Studies Department, the staff of the Carsey Will Center, they've been working so hard day and night to do this. It's been an extraordinary um, effort by them and also by the interns of the Pollock Theater and the interns of the Carsey Will Center. Um, today, you guys saved us several times just brilliantly. So thank you so much. Thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for coming.